Chapter 5, Part 1 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3 by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 1 At the time appointed, the Queen was ready. She had suffered so much at Edinburgh that she left it without any regret. Besides, whether to spare her the humiliations of the day before, or to conceal her departure from any partisans who might remain to her, a litter had been made ready. Mary got into it without any resistance, and after two hours' journey she reached Duddington. There a little vessel was waiting for her, which set sail directly she was on board, and next day at dawn she disembarked on the other side of the Firth of Forth in the county of Fife. Mary halted at Rosyth Castle only just long enough to breakfast, and immediately recommenced her journey, for Lord Lindsay had declared that he wished to reach his destination that same evening. Indeed, as the sun was setting, Mary perceived, gilded with his last rays, the high towers of Lochlaven Castle, situated on an islet in the midst of the lake of the same name. No doubt the royal prisoner was already expected at Lochlaven Castle, for on reaching the lakeside, Lord Lindsay's equerry unfurled his banner, which till then had remained in its case, and waved it from right to left, while his master blew a little hunting bugle which he wore hanging from his neck. A boat immediately put off from the island and came towards the arrivals, set in motion by four vigorous oarsmen, who had soon propelled it across the space which separated it from the bank. Mary silently got into it and sat down at the stern, while Lord Lindsay and his equerry stood up before her, and as her guide did not seem any more inclined to speak than she was herself to respond, she had plenty of time to examine her future dwelling. The castle, or rather the fortress of Lochlaven, already somewhat gloomy in its situation and architecture, borrowed fresh mournfulness still from the hour at which it appeared to the queen's gaze. It was so far as she could judge, amid the mists rising from the lake, one of those massive structures of the twelfth century which seemed, so fast shut up are they, the stone armor of a giant. As she drew near, Mary began to make out the contours of two great round towers, which flanked the corners and gave it the severe character of a state prison. A clump of ancient trees enclosed by a high wall, or rather by a rampart, rose at its north front, and seemed vegetation in stone, and completed the general effect of this gloomy abode, while, on the contrary, the eye wandering from it and passing from islands to islands, lost itself in the west, in the north, and in the south, in the vast plain of Kinross, or stopped southwards at the jagged summits of Ben Lamont, whose farthest slopes died down on the shores of the lake. Three persons awaited Mary at the castle door. Lady Douglas, William Douglas, her son, and a child of twelve who was called Little Douglas, and who was neither a son nor a brother of the inhabitants of the castle, but merely a distant relative. As one can imagine, there were a few compliments between Mary and her hosts, and the queen conducted to her apartment, which was on the first floor, and of which the windows overlooked the lake, was soon left with Mary Seaton, the only one of the four Marys who had been allowed to accompany her. However, Rapid as the interview had been, and short and measured the words exchanged between the prisoner and her jailers, Mary had had time, together with what she knew of them beforehand, to construct for herself a fairly accurate idea of the new personages who had just mingled in her history. Lady Lochlaven, wife of Lord William Douglas, of whom we have already said a few words at the beginning of this history, was a woman of from fifty-five to sixty years of age, who had been handsome enough in her youth to fix upon herself the glances of King James V, and who had had a son by him, who was this same Murray whom we have already seen figuring so often in Mary's history, and who, although his birth was illegitimate, had always been treated as a brother by the Queen. Lady Lochlaven had had a momentary hope, so great was the king's love for her, of becoming his wife, which upon the whole was possible, the family of Mar, from which she was descended, being the equal of the most ancient and the noblest families in Scotland. But unluckily, perhaps slanderously, certain talk which was circulating among the young noblemen of the time came to James's ears. It was said that together with her royal lover, the beautiful favorite had another, whom she had chosen, no doubt from curiosity, from the very lowest class. It was added that this Porterfield, or Porterfield, was the real father of the child, who had already received the name of James Stuart, and whom the king was educating as his son at the monastery of St. Andrews. These rumors, well-founded or not, had therefore stopped James V at the moment when, in gratitude to her who had given him a son, he was on the point of raising her to the rank of queen, so that instead of marrying her to himself, he had invited her to choose among the nobles at court and as she was very handsome, and the king's favor went with the marriage, this choice, which fell on Lord William Douglas of Lochlaven, uh, did not meet with any resistance on his part. However, in spite of this direct protection that James V preserved for her all his life, Lady Douglas could never forget that she had fingered higher fortune, 
Moreover, she had a hatred for the one who, according to herself, had usurped her place, and poor Mary had naturally inherited the profound animosity that Lady Douglas bore to her mother, which had already come to light in the few words that the two women had exchanged. Besides, in aging, whether from repentance for her errors or from hypocrisy, Lady Douglas had become a prude and a Puritan, so that at this time she united with the natural acrimony of her character all the stiffness of the new religion she had adopted. William Douglas, who was the eldest son of Lord Lochlaven on his mother's side, half-brother of Murray, was a man of from thirty-five to thirty-six years of age, athletic with hard and strongly pronounced features, red-haired like all the younger branch, and who had inherited that paternal hatred that for a century the Douglases cherished against the Stuarts, and which was shown by so many plots, rebellions, and assassinations. According as fortune had favored or deserted Murray, William Douglas had seen the rays of the fraternal star draw near or away from him. He had then felt that he was living in another's life, and was devoted body and soul to him who was his cause of greatness or of abasement. Mary's fall, which must necessarily raise Murray, was thus a source of joy for him, and the Confederate lords could not have chosen a better than in confiding the safekeeping of their prisoner to the instinctive spite of Lady Douglas and to the intelligent hatred of her son. As to little Douglas, he was, as we have said, a child of twelve, for some months an orphan whom the Lochlavens had taken charge of, and whom they made by the bread they gave him by all sorts of harshness. The result was that the child, proud and spiteful as a Douglas, and knowing, although his fortune was inferior, that his birth was equal to his proud relatives, had little by little changed his early gratitude into lasting and profound hatred. For one used to say that among the Douglases there was an age for loving, but that there was none for hating. It results that, feeling his weakness and isolation, the child was self-contained with strength beyond his years, and humble and submissive in appearance only awaited the moment when, a grown-up young man, he could leave Lochleven, and perhaps avenge himself for the proud protection of those who dwelt there. But the feelings that we have just expressed did not extend to all the members of the family. As much as from the bottom of his heart, the little Douglas detested William and his mother. So much he loved George, the second loved lady Lochleven's sons, of whom we have not yet spoken, because, being away from the castle when the queen arrived, we have not yet found an opportunity to present him to our readers. George, who at this time might have been about twenty-five or twenty-six years old, was the second son of Lord Lochleven, but by a singular chance that his mother's adventurous youth had caused Sir William to interpret amiss, this second son had none of the characteristic features of the Douglases' full cheeks, high color, large ears, and red hair. The result was that poor George, who on the contrary had been given by nature pale cheeks, dark blue eyes, and black hair, had been since coming into the world an object of indifference to his father and of dislike to his elder brother. As to his mother, whether she were indeed in good faith surprised, like Lord Douglas, at this difference in race, whether she knew the cause and inwardly reproached herself, George had never been, ostensibly at least, the object of a very lively maternal affection. So the young man, followed from his childhood by a fatality that he could not explain, had sprung up like a wild shrub, full of sap and strength, but uncultivated and solitary. Besides, from the time when he was fifteen, one was accustomed to his motiveless absences, which the indifference that everyone bore him made moreover perfectly explicable. From time to time, however, he was seen to reappear at the castle, like those migratory birds which always return to the same place but only stay a moment, but then take their way again without one's knowing towards what spot in the world they are directing their flight. An instinct of misfortune in common had drawn little Douglas to George. George, seeing the child ill-treated by every one, had conceived an affection for him, and little Douglas, feeling himself loved amid the atmosphere of indifference around him, turned with open arms and heart to George. It resulted from this mutual liking that one day, when the child had committed I do not know what fault, and that William Douglas raised the whip he beat his dogs with to strike him, that George, who was sitting on a stone, sad and thoughtful, had immediately sprung up, snatched the whip from his brother's hands, and had thrown it far from him. At this insult William had drawn his sword and George his, so that these two brothers, who had hated one another for twenty years like two enemies, were going to cut one another's throats, when little Douglas, who had picked up the whip, coming back and kneeling before William, offered him the ignominious weapon, saying, "'Strike, cousin. I have deserved it.' This behavior of the child had caused some minutes' reflection to the two young men, who, terrified at the crime they were about to commit, had returned their swords to their scabbards and had each gone away in silence. Since this incident the friendship of George and little Douglas had acquired new strength, and on the child's side it had become veneration. We dwell upon all these details somewhat at length, perhaps, but no doubt our readers will pardon us when they see the use to be made of them. 
This is the family, less George, who, as we have said, was absent at the time of her arrival, into the midst of which the queen had fallen, passing in a moment from the summit of power to the position of a prisoner, for from the day following her arrival Mary saw that it was by such a title she was an inmate of Lochleven Castle. In fact, Lady Douglas presented herself before her as soon as it was morning, and with an embarrassment and dislike ill-disguised beneath an appearance of respectful indifference, invited Mary to follow her and take stock of the several parts of the fortress, which had been chosen beforehand for her private use. She then made her go through three rooms, of which one was to serve as her bedroom, the second as sitting-room, and the third as antechamber. Afterwards, leading the way down a spiral staircase which looked into the great hall of the castle, its only outlet, she had crossed this hall and had taken Mary into the garden whose trees the queen had seen topping the high walls on her arrival. It was a little square of ground, forming a flower-bed in the midst of which was an artificial fountain. It was entered by a very low door, repeated in the opposite wall. This second door looked on to the lake, and like all the castle doors, whose keys, however, never left the belt or the pillow of William Douglas, it was guarded night and day by a sentinel. This was now the whole domain of her who had possessed the palaces, the plains, and the mountains of an entire kingdom. Mary, on returning to her room, found breakfast ready, and William Douglas standing near the table he was going to fulfill about the queen the duties of carver and taster. In spite of their hatred for Mary, the Douglases would have considered it an eternal blemish on their honor if any accident should have befallen the queen while she was dwelling in their castle, and it was in order that the queen herself should not entertain any fear in this respect that William Douglas, in his quality of lord of the manor, had not only desired to carve before the queen, but even to taste first in her presence all the dishes served to her, as well as the water and the several wines to be brought her. This precaution saddened Mary more than it reassured her, for she understood— that while she stayed in the castle, this ceremony would prevent any intimacy at table. However, it proceeded from too noble an intention for her to impute it as a crime to her hosts. She resigned herself then to this company, insupportable as it was to her, only from that day forward she so cut short her meals that all the time she was at Loch Laven, her longest dinners barely lasted more than a quarter of an hour. Two days after her arrival, Mary, on sitting down to table for breakfast, found on her plate a letter addressed to her which had been put there by William Douglas. Mary recognized Murray's handwriting, and her first feeling was one of joy, for if a ray of hope remained to her it came from her brother, to whom she had always been perfectly kind, whom from a prior of St. Andrew's she had made an earl in bestowing on him the splendid estates which performed part of the old earldom of Murray, and to whom, which was of more importance, she had since pardoned, or pretended to pardon, the part he had taken in Rizzio's assassination. Her astonishment was great then, when, having opened the letter, she found in it bitter reproaches for her conduct, an exhortation to do penance, and an assurance several times repeated that she should never leave her prison. He ended this letter in announcing to her that, in spite of his distaste for public affairs, he had been obliged to accept the regency, which he had done less for his country than for his sister, seeing that it was the sole means he had of standing in the way of the ignominious trial to which the nobles wished to bring her, as author, or at least as chief accomplice, of Darnley's death. This imprisonment was then clearly a great good fortune for her, and she ought to thank heaven for it, as an alleviation of the fate awaiting her if he had not interceded for her. This letter was a lightning stroke for Mary. Only, as she did not wish to give her enemies the delight of seeing her suffer, she contained her grief, and turning to William Douglas. "'My lord,' said she, "'this letter contains news that you doubtless know already, for although we are not children by the same mother, he who writes to me is related to us in the same degree, and will not have desired to write to his sister without writing to his brother at the same time. Besides, as a good son, he will have desired to acquaint his mother with the unlooked-for greatness that has befallen him.' "'Yes, madam,' replied William. "'We know since yesterday that, for the welfare of Scotland, my brother has been named regent, and as he is a son as respectful to his mother as he is devoted to his country, we hope that he will repair the evil that for five years favorites of every sort and kind have done to both.' "'It is like a good son, and at the same time like a courteous host, to go back no farther into the history of Scotland,' replied Mary Stuart and not to make the daughter blush for the father's errors, for I have heard say that the evil which your lordship laments was prior to the time to which you assign it, and that King James V also had formerly favorites, both male and female. It is true that they add that the one's as ill-rewarded his friendship as the other's his love, 
in this if you are ignorant of it my lord you can be instructed if he is still living by a certain porterfeld or porterfield i don't know which understanding these names of the lower classes too ill to retain and pronounce them but about which in my stead your noble mother could give you information with these words mary stuart rose and leaving william douglas crimson with rage she returned into her bedroom and bolted the door behind her all that day mary did not come down remaining at her window from which she at least enjoyed a splendid view over the plains and village of kinross but this vast extent only contracted her heart the more when bringing her gaze back from the horizon to the castle she beheld its walls surrounded on all sides by the deep waters of the lake on whose wide surface a single boat where little douglas was fishing was rocking like a speck for some moments mary's eyes mechanically rested on this child whom she had already seen upon her arrival when suddenly a horn sounded from the kinross side at the same moment little douglas threw away his line and began to row towards the shore whence the signal had come with skill and strength beyond his years mary who had let her gaze rest on him absently continued to follow him with her eyes and saw him make for a spot on the shore so distant that the boat seemed to her at length but an imperceptible speck but soon it reappeared growing larger as it approached and mary could then observe that it was bringing back to the castle a new passenger who having in his turn taken the oars made the little skiff fly over the tranquil water of the lake where it left a furrow gleaming in the last rays of the sun very soon flying on with the swiftness of a bird it was near enough for mary to see that the skilful and vigorous oarsman was a young man from twenty-five to twenty-six years of age with long black hair clad in a close coat of green cloth and wearing a highlander's cap adorned with an eagle's feather then as with his back turned to the window he drew nearer little douglas was leaning on his shoulder said a few words which made him turn round towards the queen immediately mary with an instinctive movement rather than with the dread of being an object of idle curiosity drew back but not so quickly however but that she had been able to see the handsome pale face of the unknown who when she returned to the window had disappeared behind one of the corners of the castle everything is a cause of conjecture to a prisoner it seemed to mary that this young man's face was not unknown to her and that he had seen her already but though great the care with which she questioned her memory she could not recall any distinct remembrance so much so that the queen ended in thinking it was the play of her imagination or that some vague and distant resemblance had deceived her however in spite of mary this idea had taken an important place in her mind she incessantly saw this little boat skimming the water and the young man and the child who were in it drawing near her as if to bring her help it followed that although there had been nothing real in all these captives dreams she slept that night a calmer sleep than she had yet done since she had been in lochlaven castle next day on rising mary ran to her window the weather was fine and everything seemed to smile on her the water the heavens and the earth but without being able to account for the restraining motive she did not want to go down into the garden before breakfast when the door opened she turned quickly round it was on the day before william douglas who came to fulfil his duty as taster the breakfast was a short and silent one then as soon as douglas had withdrawn mary descended in her turn in crossing the courtyard she saw two horses ready saddled which pointed to the near departure of a master and a squire was it the young man with the black hair already setting out again this is what mary did not dare or did not wish to ask she consequently went her way and entered the garden at the first glance she took in its full extent it was deserted mary walked there a moment then soon tiring of the promenade she went up again to her room and passing back through the courtyard she had noticed that the horses were no longer there directly she returned into her apartment she went then to the window to see if she could discover anything upon the lake to guide her in her conjectures a boat was in fact receding and in this boat were the two horses and the two horsemen one was william douglas the other a simple squire from the house mary continued watching the boat until it had touched the shore arriving there the two horsemen got out disembarked their horses and went away at full gallop taking the same road by which the queen had come so that as the horses were prepared for a long journey mary thought that william douglas was going to edinburgh as to the boat scarcely had it landed its two passengers on the opposite shore than it returned towards the castle at that moment mary seaton announced to the queen that lady douglas was asking permission to visit her it was the second time after long hatred on lady douglas's part and contemptuous indifference on the queen's that the two women were face to face therefore the queen with that instinctive impulse of coquetry which urges women in whatever situation they find themselves to desire to be beautiful above all for women made a sign to mary seaton and going to a little mirror fastened to the wall in a heavy gothic frame she arranged her curls and readjusted the lace of her collar 
Then, having seated herself in the pose most favorable to her, in a great armchair, the only one in her sitting-room, she said smilingly to Mary Seaton that she might admit Lady Douglas, who was immediately introduced. Mary's expectation was not disappointed. Lady Douglas, in spite of her hatred for James V's daughter, and mistress of herself as she thought she was, could not prevent herself from showing by a movement of surprise the impression that this marvellous beauty was making on her. She thought she should find Mary crushed by her unhappiness, pallid from her fatigues, humbled by captivity, and she saw her as calm, lovely, and haughty as usual. Mary perceived the effect that she was producing and addressing herself with an ironical smile, partly to Mary Seaton, who was leaning on the back of her chair, and partly to her who was paying her this unforeseen visit. "'We are fortunate today,' said she, "'for we are going, as it seems, to enjoy the society of our good hostess, whom we thank besides for having kindly maintained with us the empty ceremony of announcing herself, a ceremony with which, having the keys of our apartment, she could have dispensed. "'If my presence is an inconvenience to your grace,' replied Lady Lochleven, "'I am all the more sorry for it, as circumstances will oblige me to impose it twice daily, at least during the absence of my son, who is summoned to Edinburgh by the regent. This is of what I came to inform your grace, not with the empty ceremonial of the court, but with the consideration which Lady Lochleven owes to every one who has received hospitality in her castle. "'Our good hostess mistakes our intention,' Mary answered with affected good nature, "'and the regent himself can bear witness to the pleasure we have always had in bringing nearer to us the persons who can recall to us, even indirectly, our well-beloved father James V. It will be therefore unjustly that Lady Douglas will interpret in a manner disagreeable to herself our surprise at seeing her.' and the hospitality that she offers us so obligingly does not promise us, in spite of her good will, sufficient distractions that we should deprive ourselves of those that her visits cannot fail to procure us. "'Unfortunately, madam,' replied Lady Lochleven, whom Mary was keeping standing before her, "'whatever pleasure I myself derive from these visits, I shall be obliged to deprive myself of, except at the times I have mentioned.' I am now too old to bear fatigue, and I have always been too proud to endure sarcasms. Really, Seaton, cried Mary, seeming to recollect herself, we had not dreamed that Lady Lochleven, having won her right to a stool at the court of the king, my father, would have need to preserve it in the prison of the queen, his daughter. Bring forward a seat, Seaton, that we be not deprived so soon, and by a failure of memory on our part, of our gracious hostess's company. Or even, went on Mary, rising and pointing out her own seat to Lady Lochleven, who was making a motion to withdraw, if a stool does not suit you, my lady, take this easy chair. You will not be the first member of your family to sit in my place. At this last allusion, which recalled to her Murray's usurpation, Lady Lochleven was no doubt about to make some exceedingly bitter reply, when the young man with the dark hair appeared on the threshold without being announced, and, advancing towards Lady Lochleven without saluting Mary, "'Madame,' said he, bowing to the former, "'the boat which took my brother has just returned, and one of the men in it is charged with a pressing charge that Lord William forgot to make to you himself.' Then, saluting the old lady with the same respect, he immediately went out of the room without even glancing at the queen, who, hurt by this impertinence, turned round to Mary Seaton, and with her usual calm. "'What have they told us, Seaton, of injurious rumours which were spread about our worthy hostess, apropos of a child with a pale face and dark hair? If this child, as I have every reason to believe, has become the young man who just went out of the room, I am ready to affirm to all the incredulous that he is a true Douglas, if not for courage, of which we cannot judge, then for insolence, of which he has just given us proofs. Let us return, darling, continued the queen, leaning on Mary Seaton's arm, for our good hostess, out of courtesy, might think herself obliged to keep us company longer, while we know that she is impatiently awaited elsewhere. With these words Mary went into her bedroom, while the old lady, still quite stunned with the shower of sarcasms that the queen had rained on her, withdrew, murmuring, "'Yes, yes, he is a Douglas, and with God's help he will prove it, I hope.' The queen had had strength as long as she was sustained by her enemy's presence, but scarcely was she alone than she sank into a chair, and no longer having any witness of her weakness than Mary Seaton, burst into tears. Indeed, she had just been cruelly wounded— Till then no man had come near her who had not paid homage either to the majesty of her rank or to the beauty of her countenance. 
but precisely he on whom she had reckoned without knowing why with instinctive hopes insulted her at one and the same time in her double pride of queen and woman thus she remained shut up till evening at dinner-time just as lady lochleven had informed mary she ascended to the queen's apartment in her dress of honour and preceding four servants who were carrying the several dishes composing the prisoner's repast and who in their turn were followed by the old castle steward having as on days of great ceremony his gold chain round his neck and his ivory stick in his hand the servants placed the dishes on the table and waited in silence for the moment when it should please the queen to come out of her room but at this moment the door opened and in place of the queen mary seaton appeared madame said she on entering her grace was indisposed during the day and will take nothing this evening it will be useless then for you to wait longer permit me to hope replied lady lochleven that she will change her decision in any case see me perform my office at these words a servant handed lady lochleven bread and salt on a silver salver while the old steward who in the absence of william douglas fulfilled the duties of carver served to her on a plate of the same metal a morsel from each of the dishes that had been brought then this transaction ended so the queen will not appear to-day lady lochleven inquired it is her majesty's resolve replied mary seaton our presence is then needless said the old lady but in any case the table is served and if her grace should have need of anything else she would have but to name it with these words lady lochleven with the same stiffness and the same dignity which she had come withdrew followed by her four servants and her steward as lady lochleven had foreseen the queen yielding to the entreaties of mary seaton came out of her room at last towards eight o'clock in the evening sat down to table and served by the only maid of honour left her ate a little then getting up she went to the window it was one of those magnificent summer evenings on which the whole of nature seems making holiday the sky was studded with stars which were reflected in the lake and in their midst like a more fiery star the flame of the chafing dish shone burning at the stern of a little boat the queen by the gleam of the light it shed perceived george douglas and little douglas who were fishing however great her wish to profit by this fine evening to breathe the pure night air the sight of this young man who had so grossly insulted her this very day made such a keen impression on her that she shut her window directly and retiring into her room went to bed and made her companion in captivity read several prayers aloud then not being able to sleep so greatly was she agitated she rose and throwing on a mantle went again to the window the boat had disappeared mary spent part of the night gazing into the immensity of the heavens or into the depths of the lake but in spite of the nature of the thoughts agitating her she none the less found very great physical alleviation in contact with this pure air and in contemplation of this peaceful and silent night thus she awoke next day calmer and more resigned unfortunately the sight of lady lochleven who presented herself at breakfast time to fulfil her duties as taster brought back her irritability perhaps however things would have gone on smoothly if lady lochleven instead of remaining standing by the sideboard had withdrawn after having tasted the various dishes of the courses but this insisting on remaining throughout the meal which was at the bottom a mark of respect seemed to the queen unbearable tyranny darling said she speaking to mary seaton have you already forgotten that our good hostess complained yesterday of the fatigue she felt in standing bring her then one of the two stools which compose our royal furniture and take care that it is not the one with the leg broken if the furniture of lochleven castle is in such bad condition madam the old lady replied it is the fault of the kings of scotland the poor douglases for nearly a century have had such a small part of their sovereign's favour that they have not been able to keep up the splendour of their ancestors to the level of that of private individuals and because there was in scotland a certain musician as i am informed who spent their income for a whole year in one month those who know how to take so well my lady the queen answered have no need of being given to it seems to me the douglases have lost nothing by waiting and there is not a younger son of this noble family who might not aspire to the highest alliances it is truly vexatious that our sister the queen of england has taken a vow of virginity as is stated or rather interrupted lady lochleven that the queen of scotland is not a widow by a third husband but continued the old lady pretending to recollect herself i do not say that to reproach your grace catholics look upon marriage as a sacrament and on this head receive it as often as they can this then returned mary 
is the difference between them and the Huguenots, for they, not having the same respect for it, think it is allowed them to dispense with it in certain circumstances. At this terrible sarcasm, Lady Lochleven took a step towards Mary Stuart, holding in her hand the knife, which she had just been using to cut off a piece of meat, brought her to taste. But the queen rose up with so great a calm and with such majesty that either from involuntary respect or shame of her first impulse she let fall the weapon she was holding, and not finding anything sufficiently strong in reply to express her feelings, she signed to the servants to follow her and went out of the apartment with all the dignity that anger permitted her to summon to her aid. Scarcely had Lady Lochleven left the room than the queen sat down again, joyful and triumphant at the victory she had just gained and ate with a better appetite than she had yet done since she was a prisoner, while Mary Seaton deplored in a low tone and with all possible respect this fatal gift of repartee that Mary had received, and which, with her beauty, was one of the causes of all her misfortunes. But the queen did nothing but laugh at all her observations, saying she was curious to see the figure her good hostess would cut at dinner-time. After breakfast, the queen went down into the garden. Her satisfied pride had restored some of her cheerfulness, so much so that seeing while crossing the hall a mandolin lying forgotten on a chair, she told Mary Seaton to take it, to see, she said, if she could recall her old talent. In reality, the queen was one of the best musicians of the time and played admirably, says Brenton, on the lute and viol d'amour, an instrument much resembling the mandolin. Mary Seaton obeyed. Arrived in the garden, the queen sat down in the deepest shade, and there, having tuned her instrument, she at first drew from it lively and light tones, which soon darkened little by little, at the same time that her countenance assumed a hue of deep melancholy. Mary Seaton looked at her with uneasiness, although for a long time she had been used to these sudden changes in her mistress's humor, and she was about to ask the reason of this gloomy veil suddenly spread over her face, when, regulating her harmonies, Mary began to sing in a low voice, and as if for herself alone, the following verses. Caverns, meadows, plains and mounts, lands of tree and stone, rivers, rivulets and founts by which I stray alone. Bewailing as I go with tears that overflow, sing will I the miserable woe that bids me grieve and sigh. Aye, but what is here to lend ear to my lament? What is here can comprehend my dull discontent? Neither grass nor reed nor the ripples heed, flowing by while the stream with speed hastens from my eye. Vainly does my wounded heart hope, alas, to heal, seeking to allay its smart things that cannot feel. Better should my pain bitterly complain, crying shrill to thee who dost constrain my spirit to such ill. Goddess, who shalt never die, list to what I say, thou who makest me to lie weak beneath thy sway, if my life must know, ending at thy blow, cruelest, own it perished so, but at thy behest. Lo, my face may all men see, slowly pine and fade, e'en as ice doth melt and flee near a furnace laid, yet the burning ray wasting me away, passion's glow wakens no display of pity for my woe. Yet does every neighbor tree, every rocky wall, this my sorrow know and see. So in brief doth all nature know aright this my sorry plight. Thou alone takest thy delight to hear me cry and moan. But if it be thy will to see tormented still wretched me, then let my woeful ill immortal be. This last verse died away as if the queen were exhausted, and at the same time the mandolin slipped from her hands and would have fallen to the ground had not Mary Seaton thrown herself on her knees and prevented it. The young girl remained thus at her mistress's feet for some time, gazing at her silently, and as she saw that she was losing herself more and more in gloomy reverie, "'Have those lines brought back to your majesty some sad remembrance?' she asked hesitatingly. "'Oh, yes,' answered the queen. "'They reminded me of the unfortunate being who composed them. "'And may I, without indiscretion, inquire of your grace who is their author?' Alas, he was a noble, brave, and handsome young man, with a faithful heart and a hot head, who would defend me to-day if I had defended him then. But his boldness seemed to me rashness, and his fault a crime. What was to be done? I did not love him. Poor Chatelard! I was very cruel to him. But you did not prosecute him. It was your brother. You did not condemn him. The judges did. 
yes yes i know that he too was murray's victim and that is no doubt the reason that i am calling him to mind just now but i was able to pardon him mary and i was inflexible i let ascend the scaffold a man whose only crime was in loving me too well and now i am astonished and complain of being abandoned by every one listen darling there is one thing that terrifies me it is that when i search within myself i find that i have not only deserved my fate but even that god did not punish me severely enough what strange thoughts for your grace cried mary and see where those unlucky lines which returned to your mind have led you the very day when you were beginning to recover a little of your cheerfulness alas replied the queen shaking her head and uttering a deep sigh for six years very few days have passed that i have not repeated those lines to myself although it may be for the first time to-day that i repeat them aloud he was a frenchman too mary they have exiled from me taken or killed all who came to me from france do you remember that vessel which was swallowed up before our eyes when we came out of calais harbour i exclaimed then that it was a sad omen you all wanted to reassure me well who was right now you or i the queen was in one of those fits of sadness for which tears are the sole remedy so mary seaton perceiving that not only would every consolation be vain but also unreasonable far from continuing to react against her mistress's melancholy fully agreed with her it followed that the queen who was suffocating began to weep and that her tears brought her comfort then little by little she regained self-control and this crisis passed as usual leaving her firmer and more resolute than ever so that when she went up to her room again it was impossible to read the slightest alteration in her countenance the dinner hour was approaching and mary who in the morning was looking forward impatiently to the enjoyment of her triumph over lady lochleven now saw her advance with uneasiness the mere idea of again facing this woman whose pride one was always obliged to oppose with insolence was after the moral fatigues of the day a fresh weariness so she decided not to appear for dinner as on the day before she was all the more glad she had taken this resolution that this time it was not lady lochleven who came to fulfil the duties enjoined on a member of the family to make the queen easy but george douglas whom his mother in her displeasure at the morning scene sent to replace her thus when mary seaton told the queen that she saw the young man with dark hair cross the courtyard on his way to her mary still further congratulated herself on her decision for this young man's insolence had wounded her more deeply than all his mother's haughty insults the queen was not a little astonished then when in a few moments mary seaton returned and informed her that george douglas having sent away the servants desired the honour of speaking to her on a matter of importance at first the queen refused but mary seaton told her that the young man's air and manner this time were so different from what she had seen two days before that she thought her mistress would be wrong to refuse his request the queen rose then and with the pride and majesty habitual to her entered the adjoining room and having taken three steps stopped with a disdainful air waiting for george to address her end of chapter five part one recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter 5, Part 2 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3, by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5, Part 2 Mary Seaton had spoken truly. George Douglas was now another man. Today he seemed to be as respectful and timid as the preceding day he had seemed haughty and proud. He, in his turn, made a step towards the Queen, but seeing Mary Seaton standing behind her, Madame, said he, I wish to speak to your majesty alone. Shall I not obtain this favor? Mary Seaton is not a stranger to me, sir. She is my sister, my friend. She is more than all that. She is my companion in captivity. And by all these claims, madame, I have the utmost veneration for her, but what I have to tell you cannot be heard by other ears than yours. Thus, madame, as the opportunity furnished now may perhaps never present itself again, in the name of what is dearest to you, grant me what I ask. There was such a tone of respectful prayer in George's voice that Mary turned to the young girl and making her a friendly sign with her hand. "'Go then, darling,' she said. "'But be easy. You will lose nothing by not hearing. Go.' Mary Seaton withdrew. The Queen smilingly looked after her till the door was shut, then turning to George. "'Now, sir,' said she, 
we are alone. Speak. But George, instead of replying, advanced to the queen, and kneeling on one knee, drew from his breast a paper which he presented to her. Mary took it with amazement, unfolded it, glancing at Douglas, remained in the same posture, and read as follows. We earls, lords, and barons, in consideration that our queen is detained at Loch Laven, and that her faithful subjects cannot have access to her person, seeing, on the other hand, that our duty pledges us to provide for her safety, promise and swear to employ all reasonable means which will depend on us to set her at liberty again, on conditions compatible with the honor of her majesty, the welfare of the kingdom, and even with the safety of those who keep her in prison, provided that they consent to give her up that if they refuse we declare that we are prepared to make use of ourselves our children our friends our servants our vassals our goods our persons and our lives to restore her to liberty to procure the safety of the prince and to cooperate in punishing the late king's murderers if we are assailed for this intent whether as a body or in private we promise to defend ourselves and to aid one another under pain of infamy and perjury so may god help us given with our own hands at dumberton st andrews argyll huntley abroth galloway ross fleming harry's stirling kilwinning hamilton and st clair knight and seaton cried mary among all these signatures i do not see that of my faithful seaton douglas still kneeling drew from his breast a second paper and presented it to the queen with the same marks of respect it contained only these few words Trust George Douglas, for your majesty has no more devoted friend in the entire kingdom, Seaton. Mary lowered her eyes to Douglas with an expression which was hers only, then giving him her hand to raise him. Ah, said she with a sigh more of joy than of sadness, now I see that God, in spite of my faults, has not yet abandoned me. But how is it in this castle that you are Douglas? Oh, it is incredible. Madame, replied George, Seven years have passed since I saw you in France for the first time, and for seven years I have loved you. Mary moved, but Douglas put forth his hand and shook his head with an air of such profound sadness that she understood that she might hear what the young man had to say. He continued, Reassure yourself, madame. I should never have made this confession if, while explaining my conduct to you, this confession would not have given you greater confidence in me. Yes. For seven years I have loved you, but as one loves a star that one can never reach, a Madonna to whom one can only pray. For seven years I have followed you everywhere, without you ever having paid attention to me, without my saying a word or making a gesture to attract your notice. I was on the night to Mevillon's galley when you crossed to Scotland. I was among the regent's soldiers when you beat Huntley. I was in the escort which accompanied you when you went to see the sick king at Glasgow. I reached Edinburgh an hour after you had left it for Loch Laven and then it seemed to me that my mission was revealed to me for the first time, and that this love for which till then I had reproached myself as a crime was on the contrary a favor from God. I learned that the lords were assembled at Dumbarton. I flew thither. I pledged my name. I pledged my honor. I pledged my life. And I obtained from them, thanks to the facility I had for coming into this fortress, the happiness of bringing you the paper they have just signed. Now, madame, forget all that i have told you except the assurance of my devotion and respect forget that i am near you i am used to not being seen only if you have need of my life make a sign for seven years of my life has been yours alas replied mary i was complaining this morning of no longer being loved and i ought to complain on the contrary that i am still loved for the love that i inspire is fatal and mortal look back douglas and count the tombs that, young as I am, I have already left on my path. Francis the Second, Chatelard, Rizzio, Darnley. Oh, to attach oneself to my fortunes, more than love is needed. Now heroism and devotion are requisite so much the more, that as you have said, Douglas, it is love without any possible reward. Do you understand? Oh, madam, madam, answered Douglas, is it not reward beyond my deserts to see you daily, to cherish the hope that liberty will be restored to you through me, and to have at least, if I do not give it to you, the certainty of dying in your sight? Poor young man, murmured Mary, her eyes raised to heaven as if she were reading there beforehand the fate awaiting her new defender. Happy Douglas, on the contrary, cried George, seizing the queen's hand and kissing it with perhaps still more respect than love. Happy Douglas! for in obtaining a sign from your majesty he has already obtained more than he had hoped 
"'And upon what have you decided with my friends?' said the queen, raising Douglas, who till then had remained on his knees before her. "'Nothing yet,' George replied, "'for we scarcely had time to see one another. Your escape, impossible without me, is difficult even with me, and your majesty has seen that I was obliged publicly to fail in respect, to obtain from my mother the confidence which gives me the good fortune of seeing you to-day. If this confidence on my mother's or my brother's part ever extends to giving up to me the castle keys, then you are saved.' let your majesty not be surprised at anything then in the presence of others i shall ever be always a douglas that is an enemy and except your life be in danger madame i shall not utter a word i shall not make a gesture which might betray the faith that i have sworn you but on your side let your grace know well that present or absent whether i am silent or speak whether i act or remain inert all will be in appearance only save my devotion only continued Douglas, approaching the window and showing to the queen a little house on Kinross Hill. "'Only look every evening in that direction, madame, and so long as you see a light shine there, your friends will be keeping watch for you, and you need not lose hope.' "'Thanks, Douglas, thanks,' said the queen. "'It does one good to meet with a heart like yours from time to time. Oh, thanks!' "'And now, madame,' replied the young man, I must leave your majesty. To remain longer with you would be to raise suspicions, and a single doubt of me, think of it well, madame, and that light which is your sole beacon is extinguished, and all returns into night. With these words Douglas bowed more respectfully than he had yet done, and withdrew, leaving Mary full of hope, and still more full of pride, for this time the homage that she had just received was certainly for the woman, and not for the queen. As the queen had told him, Mary Seaton was informed of everything even the love of douglas and the two women impatiently awaited the evening to see if the promised star would shine on the horizon their hope was not in vain at the appointed time the beacon was lit the queen trembled with joy for it was the confirmation of her hopes and her companion could not tear her from the window where she remained with her gaze fastened on the little house in kinross at last she yielded to mary seaton's prayers and consented to go to bed but twice in the night she rose noiselessly to go to the window the light was always shining, and was not extinguished till dawn, with its sisters the stars. Next day at breakfast, George announced to the Queen the return of his brother William Douglas. He arrived the same evening, as to himself, George had to leave Loch Laven next morning, to confer with the nobles who had signed the declaration, and who had immediately separated to raise troops in their several counties. The Queen could not attempt to good purpose any escape, but at a time, when she would be sure of gathering round her an army strong enough to hold the country, as to him douglas one was so used to his silent disappearances and to his unexpected returns that there was no reason to fear that this departure would inspire any suspicion all passed as george had said in the evening the sound of a bugle announced the arrival of william douglas he had with him lord ruthven the son of him who had assassinated rizzio and who exiled with morton after the murder died in england of the sickness with which he was already attacked the day of the terrible catastrophe in which we have seen him take such a large share he preceded by one day Lord Lindsay of Byers and Sir Robert Melville, brother of Mary's former ambassador to Elizabeth. All three were charged with a mission from the regent to the queen. On the following day, everything fell back into the usual routine, and William Douglas resumed his duties as carver. Breakfast passed without Mary's having learned anything of George's departure or Ruthven's arrival. On rising from the table, she went to her window. Scarcely was she there than she heard the sound of a horn echoing on the shores of the lake and saw a little troop of horsemen halt, while waiting for the boat to come and take those who were going to the castle. The distance was too great for Mary to recognize any of the visitors, but it was clear from the signs of intelligence exchanged between the little troop and the inhabitants of the fortress that the newcomers were her enemies. This was a reason why the queen, in her uneasiness, should not lose sight for a moment of the boat which was going to fetch them. She saw only two men get into it, and immediately it put off again for the castle. As the boat drew nearer, Mary's presentiments changed to real fears, for in one of the men coming towards her she thought she made out Lord Lindsay of Byers, the same who, a week before, had brought her to her prison. It was indeed he himself, as usual in a steel helmet without a visor, which allowed one to see his coarse face designed to express strong passions, and his long black beard with grey hairs here and there, which covered his chest. His person was protected, as if it were in time of war, with his faithful suit of armor, formerly polished and well gilded, but which, exposed without ceasing to rain and mist, was now eaten up with rust. He had slung on his back, much as one slings a quiver, a broadsword. 
so heavy that it took two hands to manage it, and so long that while the hilt reached the left shoulder, the point reached the right spur. In a word, he was still the same soldier, brave to rashness but brutal to insolence, recognizing nothing but right and force, and always ready to use force when he believed himself in the right. The queen was so much taken up with the sight of Lord Lindsay of Byers that it was only just as the boat reached the shore that she glanced at his companion and recognized Robert Melville. This was some consolation, for whatever might happen she knew that she should find in him, if not ostensible, at least secret sympathy. Besides his dress, by which one could have judged him equally with Lord Lindsay, was a perfect contrast to his companions. It consisted of a black velvet doublet, with a cap and a feather of the same hue fastened to it with a gold clasp. His only weapon, offensive or defensive, was a little sword, which he seemed to wear rather as a sign of his rank than for attack or defense. As to his features and his manners, they were in harmony with this peaceful appearance. His pale countenance expressed both acuteness and intelligence. His quick eye was mild and his voice insinuating. His figure slight and a little bent by habit rather than by years, since he was but forty-five at this time, indicated an easy and conciliatory character. However, the presence of this man of peace, who seemed entrusted with watching over the demon of war, could not reassure the queen, and as to get to the landing-place in front of the great door of the castle, the boat had just disappeared behind the corner of a tower. She told Mary Seaton to go down that she might try to learn what cause brought Lord Lindsay to Loch Laven. Well, knowing that with the force of character with which she was endowed, she need know this cause but a few minutes beforehand, whatever it might be, to give her countenance that calm and that majesty which she had always found to influence her enemies. Left alone, Mary let her glance stray back through the little house in Kinross, her sole hope. But the distance was too great to distinguish anything. Besides, its shutters remained closed all day, and seemed to open only in the evening like the clouds, which, having covered the sky for a whole morning, scatter at last to reveal to the lost sailor a solitary star. She had remained no less motionless, her gaze always fixed on the same object, when she was drawn from this mute contemplation by the step of Mary Seaton. "'Well, darling,' asked the queen, turning round. "'Your majesty is not mistaken,' replied the messenger. "'It really was Sir Robert Melville and Lord Lindsay. But there came yesterday with Sir William Douglas a third ambassador, whose name, I am afraid, will be still more odious to your majesty than either of the two I have just pronounced.' "'You deceive yourself, Mary,' the queen answered. "'Neither the name of Melville nor that of Lindsay is odious to me.' Melville's, on the contrary, is, in my present circumstances, one of those which I have most pleasure in hearing. As to Lord Lindsay's, it is doubtless not agreeable to me, but it is none the less an honourable name, always borne by men rough and wild, it is true, but incapable of treachery. Tell me, then, what is this name, Mary, for you see I am calm and prepared. Alas, madam, returned Mary, calm and prepared as you may be collect all your strength not merely to hear this name uttered but also to receive in a few minutes the man who bears it for this name is that of lord ruthven mary seaton had spoken truly and this name had a terrible influence upon the queen for scarcely had it escaped the young girl's lips than mary stuart uttered a cry and turning pale as if she were about to faint caught hold of the window ledge mary seaton frightened at the effect produced by this fatal name immediately sprang to support the queen but she, stretching one hand towards her while she laid the other on her heart, "'It is nothing,' said she. "'I shall be better in a moment. Yes, Mary, yes, as you said, it is a fatal name, and mingled with one of my most bloody memories. What such men are coming to ask of me must be dreadful indeed. But no matter. I shall soon be ready to receive my brother's ambassadors, for doubtless they are sent in his name. You, darling, prevent their entering, for I must have some minutes to myself— you know me, it will not take me long. With these words, the queen withdrew with a firm step to her bedchamber. Mary Seaton was left alone, admiring that strength of character which made of Mary Stuart, in all other respects so completely womanlike a man in the hour of danger. She immediately went to the door to close it with the wooden bar that one passed between two iron rings, but the bar had been taken away so that there was no means of fastening the door from within. In a moment she heard someone coming up the stairs, and, guessing from the heavy, echoing step that this must be Lord Lindsay, she looked round her once again to see if she could find something to replace the bar. And finding nothing within reach, she passed her arm through the rings, resolved to let it be broken rather than allow anyone to approach her mistress before it suited her. Indeed, hardly had those who were coming up reached the landing than someone knocked violently, and a harsh voice cried, "'Come, come, open the door!' 
open directly and by what right said mary seaton am i ordered thus insolently to open the queen of scotland's door by the right of the ambassador of the regent to enter everywhere in his name i am lord lindsay and i am come to speak to lady mary stuart to be an ambassador answered mary seaton is not to be exempted from having oneself announced in visiting a woman and much more a queen and if this ambassador is as he says lord lindsay he will await his sovereign's leisure as every scottish noble would do in his place by saint andrew cried lord lindsay open or i will break in the door do nothing to it my lord i entreat you said another voice which mary recognized as melville's let us rather wait for lord ruthven who is not yet ready upon my soul cried lindsay shaking the door i shall not wait a second then seeing that it resisted why did you not tell me then you scamp lindsay went on speaking to the steward that the bar had been removed it is true replied he then returned lindsay with what is this silly wench securing the door with my arm my lord which i have passed through the rings as a douglas did for king james the first at a time when douglases had dark hair instead of red and were faithful instead of being traitors since you know your history so well replied lindsay in a rage you should remember that that weak barrier did not hinder graham that catherine douglas's arm was broken like a willow wand and that james the first was killed like a dog but you my lord responded the courageous young girl ought also to know the ballad that is still sung in our time now on robert graham the king's destroyer shame to robert graham clings shame who destroyed our king mary cried the queen who had overheard this altercation from her bedroom mary i command you to open the door directly do you hear mary obeyed and lord lindsay entered followed by melville who walked behind him with slow steps and bent head arrived in the middle of the second room lord lindsay stopped and looking round him well where is she then he asked and has she not already kept us waiting long enough outside without making us wait again inside or does she imagine that despite these walls and these bars she is always queen patience my lord murmured sir robert you see that lord ruthven has not yet come and since we can do nothing without him let us wait let wait who will replied lindsay inflamed with anger but it will not be i and wherever she may be i shall go and seek her with these words he made some steps towards mary stuart's bedroom but at the same moment the queen opened the door without seeming moved either at the visit or at the insolence of the visitors and so lovely and so full of majesty that each even lindsay himself was silent at her appearance and as if in obedience to a higher power bowed respectfully before her i fear i have kept you waiting my lord said the queen without replying to the ambassador's salutation otherwise than by a slight inclination of the head but a woman does not like to receive even enemies without having spent a few minutes over her toilet it is true that men are less tenacious of ceremony added she throwing a significant glance at lord lindsay's rusty armor and soiled and pierced doublet good day melville she continued without paying attention to some words of excuse stammered by lindsay be welcome in my prison as you were in my palace for i believe you as devoted to the one as to the other then turning to lindsay who was looking interrogatively at the door impatient as he was for ruthven to come you have there my lord said she pointing to the sword he carried over his shoulder a faithful companion though it is a little heavy did you expect in coming here to find enemies against whom to employ it in the contrary case it is a strange ornament for a lady's presence but no matter my lord i am too much of a steward to fear the sight of a sword even if it were naked i warn you it is not out of place here madame replied lindsay bringing it forward and leaning his elbow on its cross hilt for it is an old acquaintance of your family your ancestors my lord were brave and loyal enough for me not to refuse to believe what you tell me besides such a good blade must have rendered them good service yes madame yes surely it has done so by that kind of service that kings do not forgive he for whom it was made was archibald bell the cat and he girded himself with it the day when to justify his name he went to seize in the very tent of king james the third 
your grandfather his unworthy favorites cochrane hummel leonard and torpichin whom he hanged on louder bridge with the halters of his soldiers horses it was also with this sword that he slew at one blow in the lists spence of kilspindi who had insulted him in the presence of king james the fourth counting on his protection his masters according him and which did not guard him against it any more than his shield which it split in two at his master's death which took place two years after the defeat of flodden on whose battlefield he left his two sons and two hundred warriors of the name of douglas it passed into the hands of the earl of angus who drew it from the scabbard when he drove the hamiltons out of edinburgh and that so quickly and completely that the affair was called the sweeping of the streets finally your father james v saw it glisten in the fight of the bridge over the tweed when burkeloic stirred up by him wanted to snatch from him the guardianship of the douglases and when eighty warriors of the name of scott remained on the battlefield but said the queen how is it that this weapon after such exploits has not remained as a trophy in the douglas family no doubt the earl of angus required a great occasion to decide him to renounce in your favour this modern excalibur history of scotland by sir walter scott the abbot historical part yes no doubt madam it was upon a great occasion replied lindsay in spite of the imploring signs made by melville and this will have at least the advantage of the others in being sufficiently recent for you to remember it was ten days ago on the battlefield of carberry hill madam when the infamous bothwell had the audacity to make a public challenge in which he defied to single combat whomsoever would dare to maintain that he was not innocent of the murder of the king your husband i made him answer then i the third that he was an assassin and as he refused to fight with the other two others the, under the pretext that they were only barons i presented myself in my turn i who am an earl and a lord it was on that occasion that the noble earl of morton gave me the sword to fight him to the death so that if he had been a little more presumptuous or a little less cowardly dogs and vultures would be eating at this moment the pieces that with the help of this good sword i should have carved for them from that traitor's carcass at these words mary seaton and robert melville looked at each other in terror for the events that they recalled were so recent that they were so to speak still living in the queen's heart but the queen with incredible impassibility and smile of contempt on her lips it is easy my lord said she to vanquish an enemy who does not appear in the lists however believe me if mary had inherited the Stuarts' sword as she has inherited their sceptre your sword long as it is would yet have seemed to you too short but as you have only to relate to us now my lord what you intended doing and not what you have done think it fit that i bring you back a something of more reality for i do not suppose you have given yourself the trouble to come here purely and simply to add a chapter to the little treatise de rodomontada espagnola by monsieur de brantome you are right madame replied lindsay reddening with anger and you would already know the object of our mission if lord ruthven did not so ridiculously keep us waiting but added he have patience the matter will not be long now for here he is indeed at the moment they heard steps mounting the staircase and approaching the room and at the sound of these steps the queen who had borne with such firmness lindsay's insults grew so perceptibly paler that melville who did not take his eyes off her put out his hand towards the armchair as if to push it towards her but the queen made a sign that she had no need of it and gazed at the door with apparent calm lord ruthven appeared it was the first time that she had seen the son since rizzio had been assassinated by the father lord ruthven was both a warrior and a statesman and at this moment his dress savoured of the two professions it consisted of a close coat of embroidered buff leather elegant enough to be worn as a court undress and on which if need were one could buckle a cuirass for battle like his father he was pale like his father he was to die young and even more like his father his countenance wore that ill-omened melancholy by which fortune-tellers recognize those who are to die a violent death lord ruthven united in himself the polished dignity of a courtier and the inflexible character of a minister but quite resolved as he was to obtain from mary stuart even if it were by violence what he had come to demand in the regent's name he none the less made her on entering a cold but respectful greeting to which the queen responded with a courtesy then the steward drew up to the empty armchair a heavy table on which had been prepared everything necessary for writing and at a sign from the two lords he went out leaving the queen and her companion alone with the three ambassadors. Then the queen, seeing that this table and this armchair were put ready for her, sat down, 
and after a moment, herself breaking this silence more gloomy than any word could have been, "'My lords,' said she, "'you see that I wait. Can it be that this message which you have to communicate to me is so terrible that two soldiers as renowned as Lord Lindsay and Lord Ruthven hesitate at the moment of transmitting it?' madam answered ruthven i am not of a family as you know which ever hesitates to perform a duty painful as it may be besides we hope that your captivity has prepared you to hear what we have to tell you on the part of the secret council the secret council said the queen instituted by me by what right does it act without me no matter i am waiting for this message i suppose it is a petition to implore my mercy for the men who have dared to reach to a power that I hold only from God. Madam, replied Ruthven, who appeared to have undertaken the painful role of spokesman, while Lindsay, mute and impatient, fidgeted with the hilt of his longsword. It is distressing to me to have to undeceive you on this point. It is not your mercy that I come to ask. It is, on the contrary, the pardon of the secret council that I come to offer you. To me, my lord, to me, cried Mary, subjects offer pardon to their queen oh, it is such a new and wonderful thing that my amazement outweighs my indignation and that i beg you to continue instead of stopping there as perhaps i ought to do and i obey you so much the more willingly madame went on ruthven unperturbably that this pardon is only granted on certain conditions stated in these documents destined to re-establish the tranquillity of the state so cruelly compromised by the errors that they are going to repair and shall i be permitted my lord to read these documents or must i allured by my confidence in those who present them to me sign them with my eyes shut no madame ruthven returned the secret council desire on the contrary that you acquaint yourself with them for you must sign them freely. Read me these documents, my lord, for such a reading is, I think, included in the strange duties you have accepted. Lord Ruthven took one of the two papers that he had in his hand, and read with the impassiveness of his usual voice the following. Summoned from my tenderest youth to the government of the kingdom and to the crown of Scotland, I have carefully attended to the administration, but I have experienced so much fatigue and trouble that I no longer find my mind free enough nor my strength great enough to support the burden of affairs of state. Accordingly, and as divine favor has granted us a son whom we desire to see during our lifetime bear the crown which he has acquired by right of birth, we have resolved to abdicate, and we abdicate in his favor, by these presents, freely and voluntary, all our rights to the crown and to the government of scotland desiring that he may immediately ascend the throne as if he were called to it by our natural death and not as the effect of our own will and that our present application may have a more complete and solemn effect and that no one should put forward the claim of ignorance we give full powers to our trusty and faithful cousins the lords lindsay of byers and william ruthven to appear in our name before the nobility the clergy and the burgesses of scotland of whom they will convoke an assembly at stirling and to there renounce publicly and solemnly on our part all our claims to the crown and to the government of scotland signed freely and as the testimony of one of our last royal wishes in our castle of lochleven the june fifteen sixty seven the date was left blank there was a moment's silence after this reading then did you hear madame asked ruthven yes replied mary stuart yes i have heard rebellious words that i have not understood and i thought that my ears that one has tried to accustom for some time to a strange language still deceived me and that i have thought for your honour my lord william ruthven and my lord lindsay of byers madame answered lindsay out of patience at having kept silence so long our honour has nothing to do with the opinion of a woman who has so ill known how to watch over her own my lord said melville risking a word let him speak robert returned the queen we have in our conscience armour as well tempered as that with which lord lindsay is so prudently covered although to the shame of justice we no longer have a sword continue my lord the queen went on turning to lord ruthven is this all that my subjects require of me a date and a signature huh, doubtless it is too little and this second paper which you have kept in order to proceed by degrees 
probably contains some demand more difficult to grant than that of yielding to a child scarcely a year old a crown which belongs to me by birthright and to abandon my sceptre to take a distaff this other paper replied ruthven without letting himself be intimidated by the tone of bitter irony adopted by the queen is the deed by which your grace confirms the decision of the secret council which has named your beloved brother the earl of murray regent of the kingdom indeed said mary the secret council thinks it needs my confirmation to an act of such slight importance and my beloved brother to bear it without remorse needs that it should be i who add a fresh title to those of earl of mar and of murray that i have already bestowed upon him but one cannot desire anything more respectful and touching than all this, and I should be very wrong to complain. My lords, continued the queen, rising and changing her tone, return to those who have sent you and tell them that to such demands Mary Stuart has no answer to give. Take care, madame, responded Ruffin, for I have told you it is only on these conditions that your pardon can be granted you. And if I refuse this generous pardon, asked Mary, what will happen? i cannot pronounce beforehand madam but your grace has enough knowledge of the laws and above all of the history of scotland and england to know that murder and adultery are crimes for which more than one queen has been punished with death and upon what proofs could such a charge be founded my lord pardon my persistence which takes up your precious time but i am sufficiently interested in the matter to be permitted such a question the proof madam returned ruthven there is but one, I know, but that one is unexceptionable. It is the uh, precipitate marriage of the widow of the assassinated with the chief assassin, and the letters which have been handed over to us by James Balfour, which prove that the guilty persons had united their adulterous hearts before it was permitted them to unite their bloody hands. "'My lord,' cried the queen, "'do you forget a certain repast given in an Edinburgh tavern by the same Bothwell?' to those same noblemen who treat him to-day as an adulterer and a murderer do you forget that at the end of that meal and on the same table at which it has been given a paper was invited to sign that same woman to whom to-day you make the haste of her new wedding a crime to leave off a widow's mourning to reassume a marriage robe for if you have forgotten it my lords which would do no more honour to your sobriety than to your memory i undertake to show it to you i who have preserved it and perhaps if we search well we shall find among the signatures the names of lindsay of byers and william ruthven oh noble lord harry's cried mary loyal james melville you alone were right then when you threw yourselves at my feet entreating me not to conclude this marriage which i see it clearly to-day was only a trap set for an ignorant woman by perfidious advisers or disloyal lords madam cried Ruthven, in spite of his cold impassivity, beginning to lose command of himself, while Lindsay was giving still more noisy and less equivocal signs of impatience. "'Madame, all these discussions are beside our aim. I beg you to return to it, then, and inform us if, your life and honour guaranteed, you consent to abdicate the crown of Scotland.' "'And what safeguard should I have that the promises you hear make me will be kept?' "'Our word, madame,' proudly replied Ruthven. "'Your word, my lord, is a very feeble pledge to offer, when one so quickly forgets one's signature. Have you not some trifle to add to it, to make me a little easier than I should be with it alone?' "'Enough, Ruthven, enough!' cried Lindsay. "'Do you not see that for an hour this woman answers our proposals only by insults?' "'Yes, let us go,' said Ruthven and thank yourself only madame for the day when the thread breaks which holds the sword suspended over your head my lords cried melville my lords in heaven's name a little patience and forgive something to her who accustomed to command is to-day forced to obey very well said lindsay turning round stay with her then and try to obtain by your smooth words what is refused to our frank and loyal demand in a quarter of an hour we shall return and let the answer be ready in a quarter of an hour with these words the two noblemen went out leaving melville with the queen and one could count their footsteps from the noise that lindsay's great sword made in resounding on each step of the staircase scarcely were they alone than melville threw himself at the queen's feet madame said he you remarked just now that lord harry's and my brother had given your majesty advice that you repented not having followed 
well madame reflect on that i in my turn give you for it is more important than the other for you will regret with still some bitterness not having listened to it ah you do not know what may happen you are ignorant of what your brother is capable it seems to me however returned the queen that he has just instructed me on that head what more will he do than he has done already a public trial oh it is all i ask let me only plead my case and we shall see what judges will dare to condemn me but that is what they will take good care not to do madame for they would be mad to do it when they keep you here in this isolated castle in the care of your enemies having no witness but god who avenges crime but who does not prevent it recollect madame what machiavelli has said a king's tomb is never far from his prison you come of a family in which one dies young madame and almost always of a sudden death two of your ancestors perished by steel and one by poison oh if my death were sudden and easy cried mary yes i should accept it as an expiation for my faults for if i am proud when i compare myself with others melville i am humble when i judge myself i am unjustly accused of being an accomplice of darnley's death but i am justly condemned for having married bothwell time presses madame time presses cried melville looking at the sand which placed on the table was marking the time they are coming back they will be here in a minute and this time you must give them an answer listen madame and at least profit by your situation as much as you can you are alone here with one woman without friends without protection without power an abdication signed at such a juncture will never appear to your people to have been freely given but will always pass as having been torn from you by force and if need be madame if the day comes when such a solemn declaration is worth something well then you will have two witnesses of the violence done you the one will be mary seaton and the other he added in a low voice and looking uneasily about him the other will be robert melville hardly had he finished speaking when the footsteps of the two nobles were again heard on the staircase returning even before the quarter of an hour had elapsed a moment afterwards the door opened and ruthven appeared while over his shoulder was seen lindsay's head madame said ruthven we have returned has your grace decided we come for your answer yes said lindsay pushing aside ruthven who stood in his way and advancing to the table yes an answer clear precise positive and without dissimulation you are exacting my lord said the queen you would scarcely have the right to expect that from me if i were in full liberty on the other side of the lake and surrounded with a faithful escort but between these walls behind these bars in the depths of this fortress i shall not tell you that i sign voluntarily lest you should not believe it but no matter if you want my signature well i am going to give it to you melville pass me the pen but i hope said lord ruthven that your grace is not counting on using your present position one day in argument to protest against what you are going to do the queen had already stooped to write she had already set her hand to the paper when ruthven spoke to her but scarcely had he done so than she rose up proudly and letting fall the pen my lord said she what you asked of me just now was but an abdication pure and simple and i was going to sign it but if to this abdication is joined this marginal note then i renounce of my own accord and as judging myself unworthy the throne of scotland i would not do it for the three united crowns that i have been robbed of in return take care madame cried lord lindsay seizing the queen's wrist with his steel gauntlet and squeezing it with all his angry strength take care for our patience is at an end and we could easily end by breaking what would not bend the queen remained standing and although a violent flush had passed like a flame over her countenance she did not utter a word and did not move her eyes only were fixed with such a great expression of contempt on those of the rough baron that he ashamed of the passion that had carried him away let go the hand he had seized and took a step back then raising her sleeve and showing the violent marks made on her arm by lord lindsay's steel gauntlet this is what i expected my lords said she and nothing prevents me any longer from signing yes i freely abdicate the throne and crown of scotland and there is the proof that my will has not been forced with these words she took the pen and rapidly signed the two documents held them out to lord ruffin and bowing with great dignity withdrew slowly into her room accompanied by mary seaton ruffin looked after her and when she had disappeared 
"'It doesn't matter,' he said. "'She has signed, and although the means you employed, Lindsay, may be obsolete enough in diplomacy, it is not the less efficacious, it seems.' "'No joking, Ruffin,' said Lindsay, "'for she is a noble creature, and if I had dared I should have thrown myself at her feet to ask her forgiveness.' "'There is still time,' replied Ruffin, "'and Mary, in her present situation, will not be severe upon you. Perhaps she has resolved to appeal to the judgment of God to prove her innocence, and in that case a champion such as you might well change the face of things.' "'Do not joke, Ruffin,' Lindsay answered a second time, with more violence than the first. "'For if I were as well convinced of her innocence as I am of her crime, I tell you that no one should touch a hair of her head, not even the regent.' "'The devil, my lord,' said Ruffin. "'I did not know you were so sensitive to a gentle voice and a tearful eye. You know the story of Achilles' lance, which healed with its rust the wounds it made with its edge. Do likewise, my lord, do likewise.' "'Enough, Ruffin, enough,' replied Lindsay. You are like a corselet of Milan steel, which is three times as bright as the steel armor of Glasgow, but which is at the same time thrice as hard. We know one another, Ruffin, so an end to railleries or threats. Enough, believe me, enough. And after these words, Lord Lindsay went out first, followed by Ruffin and Melville, the first with his head high and affecting an air of insolent indifference, and the second sad, his brow bent, and not even trying to disguise the painful impression which this scene had made on him. History of Scotland by Sir Walter Scott, The Abbot, Historical Part. End of chapter 5, part 2. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 6 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The queen came out of her room only in the evening, to take her place at the window which looked over the lake. At the usual time she saw the light which was henceforth her sole hope shine in the little house in Kinross. For a whole long month she had no other consolation than seeing it, every night fixed and faithful. At last, at the end of this time, and as she was beginning to despair of seeing George Douglas again, one morning on opening the window she uttered a cry. Mary Seaton ran to her, and the queen, without having strength to speak, showed her in the middle of the lake the tiny boat at anchor, and in the boat little Douglas and George, who were absorbed in fishing, their favorite amusement. The young man had arrived the day before, and as everyone was accustomed to his unexpected returns, the sentinel had not even blown the horn, and the queen had not known that at last a friend had come. However, she was three days yet without seeing this friend otherwise than she had just done, that is, on the lake. It is true that from morning till evening he did not leave that spot from which he could view the queen's window, and the queen herself, when to gaze at a wider horizon she leaned her face against the bars. At last, on the morning of the fourth day, the queen was awakened by a great noise of dogs and horns. She immediately ran to the window, for to a prisoner everything is an event, and she saw William Douglas, who was embarking with a pack of hounds and some huntsmen, in fact, making a truce for a day with his jailer's duties, to enjoy a pleasure more in harmony with his rank and birth, he was going to hunt in the woods which cover the last ridge of Ben Lamont, and which, ever sinking, die down on the banks of the lake. The queen trembled with delight, for she hoped that Lady Lochlaven would maintain her ill will, and that then George would replace his brother. This hope was not disappointed. At the usual time, the queen heard the footsteps of those who were bringing her her breakfast. The door opened, and she saw George Douglas enter preceded by the servants who were carrying the dishes. George barely bowed, but the queen, warned by him not to be surprised at anything, returned him his greeting with a disdainful air. Then the servants performed their task and went out as they were accustomed. "'At last,' said the queen, "'you are back again, then.' George motioned with his finger, went to the door to listen if all the servants had really gone away, and if no one had remained to spy. Then, returning more at ease and bowing respectfully, "'Yes, madame,' returned he, and heaven be thanked i bring good news oh tell me quickly cried the queen for staying in this castle is hell you knew that they came did you not and that they made me sign an abdication yes madame replied douglas but we also knew that your signature had been obtained from you by violence alone and our devotion to your majesty is increased thereby if possible but after all what have you done 
the Setons and the Hamiltons, who are, as your majesty knows, your most faithful servants, Mary turned round, smiling, and put out her hand to Mary Seton, have already, continued George, assembled their troops, who keep themselves in readiness for the first signal. But as they alone would not be sufficiently numerous to hold the country, we shall make our way directly to Dumbarton, whose governor is ours, and which by its position and its strength can hold out long enough against all the regent's troops to give to the faithful hearts remaining to you time to come and join us. Yes, yes, said the queen. I see clearly what we shall do once we get out of this, but how are we to get out? That is the occasion, madame, replied Douglas, for which your majesty must call to your aid that courage of which you have given such great proofs. If I have need only of courage and coolness, replied the queen, be easy, neither the one nor the other will fail me. Here is a file, said George, giving Mary Seaton that instrument which he judged unworthy to touch the queen's hands, and this evening I shall bring your majesty cords to construct a ladder. You will cut through one of the bars of this window. It is only at a height of twenty feet. I shall come up to you as much to try it as to support you. One of the garrison is in my pay. He will give us passage by the door, it is his duty to guard, and you will be free. And when will that be? cried the queen. We must wait for two things, madame, replied Douglas. The first, to collect at Kinross an escort sufficient for your majesty's safety. The second, that the turn for night watch of Thomas Warden should happen to be at an isolated door that we can reach without being seen. And how will you know that? Do you stay at the castle then? Alas, no, madame, replied George. At the castle I am a useless and even a dangerous friend for you, while once beyond the lake I can serve you in an effectual manner. And how will you know when Warden's turn to mount guard has come? The weathercock in the north tower, instead of turning in the wind with the others, will remain fixed against it. But I, how shall I be warned? Everything is already provided for on that side. The light which shines each night in the little house in Kinross incessantly tells you that your friends keep watch for you. But when you would like to know if the hour of your deliverance approaches or recedes, in your turn place a light in this window. The other will immediately disappear. Then, placing your hand on your breast, count your heartbeats. If you reach the number twenty without the light reappearing, nothing is yet settled. If you only reach ten, the moment approaches. If the light does not leave you time to count beyond five, your escape is fixed for the following night. If it reappears no more, it is fixed for the same evening. Then the owl's cry, repeated thrice in the courtyard, will be the signal. Let down the ladder when you hear it. "'Oh, Douglas!' cried the queen. "'You alone could foresee and calculate everything thus. "'Thank you, thank you a hundred times!' "'And she gave him her hand to kiss. "'A vivid red flushed the young man's cheeks, "'but almost directly mastering his emotion, "'he kneeled down and restraining the expression of that love "'of which he had spoken to the queen, "'while promising her never more to speak of it, "'he took the hand that Mary extended and kissed it with such respect, "'yet no one could have seen in this action anything "'but the homage of devotion and fidelity.' Then, having bowed to the queen, he went out, that a longer stay with her should not give rise to any suspicions. At the dinner hour Douglas brought, as he had said, a parcel of cord. It was not enough, but when evening came Mary Seaton was to unroll it, and let fall the end from a window, and George would fasten the remainder to it. The thing was done as arranged, and without any mishap, an hour after the hunters had returned. The following day George left the castle. The queen and Mary Seaton lost no time in setting about the rope ladder, and it was finished on the third day. The same evening the queen, in her impatience, or rather to assure herself of her partisan's vigilance, then in the hope that the time of her deliverance was so near, brought her lamp to the window. Immediately, and as George Douglas had told her, the light in the little house at Kinross disappeared. The queen then laid her hand on her heart and counted up to twenty-two, then the light reappeared. They were ready for everything, but nothing was yet settled. For a week the queen thus questioned the light, and her heart beats without their number changing at last. On the eighth day she counted only as far as ten. At the eleventh the light reappeared. The queen believed herself mistaken. She did not dare to hope what this announced. She withdrew the lamp, then, at the end of a quarter of an hour, showed it again. Her unknown correspondent understood with his usual intelligence that a fresh trial was required of him, and the light in the little house disappeared in its turn. Mary again questioned the pulsations of her heart, and fast as it leaped before the twelfth beat, the propitious star was shining on the horizon. There was no longer any doubt. Everything was settled. Mary could not sleep all night. This persistency of her partisans inspired her with gratitude to the point of tears. 
The day came, and the queen several times questioned her companion to assure herself that it was not all a dream. At every sound it seemed to her that the scheme on which her liberty hung was discovered, and when at breakfast and at dinner-time William Douglas entered as usual, she hardly dared look at him for fear of reading on his face the announcement that all was lost. In the evening the queen again questioned the light. It made the same answer, nothing had altered. The beacon was always one of hope. For four days it thus continued to indicate that the moment of escape was at hand. On the evening of the fifth, before the queen had counted five beats, the light reappeared. The queen leaned upon Mary Seaton. She was nearly fainting between dread and delight. Her escape was fixed for the next evening. The queen tried once more and obtained the same reply. There was no longer a doubt. Everything was ready except the prisoner's courage, for it failed her for a moment. And if Mary Seaton had not drawn up a seat in time, she would have fallen prone. But the first moment over she collected herself as usual, and was stronger and more resolute than ever. Till midnight the queen remained at the window, her eyes fixed on that star of good omen. At last Mary Seaton persuaded her to go to bed, offering, if she had no wish to sleep, to read her some verses by M. Ronsard, or some chapters from the Amère de Histoires. But Mary had no desire, now, for any profane reading, and had her hours read, making the responses as she would have done if she had been present at a mass said by a Catholic priest. Towards dawn, however, she grew drowsy, and as Mary Seaton, for her part, was dropping with fatigue, she fell asleep directly in the armchair at the head of the queen's bed. Next day she awoke, feeling that someone was tapping her on the shoulder. It was the queen, who had already risen. "'Come and see, darling,' said she. "'Come and see the fine day that God is giving us. Oh, how alive is nature! How happy I shall be to be once more free among those plains and mountains! Decidedly, heaven is on our side!' madam replied mary i would rather see the weather less fine it would promise us a darker night and consider what we need is darkness not light listen said the queen it is by this we are going to see if god is indeed for us if the weather remains as it is yes you are right he abandons us but if it clouds over oh then darling this will be a certain proof of his protection will it not mary seaton smiled nodding that she adopted her mistress's superstition then the queen, incapable of remaining idle in her great preoccupation of mind, collected the few jewels that she had preserved, enclosed them in a casket, got ready for the evening a black dress in order to be still better hidden in the darkness, and, these preparations made, she sat down again at the window, ceaselessly carrying her eyes from the lake to the little house in Kinross, shut up and dumb as usual. The dinner hour arrived, the queen was so happy that she received William Douglas with more good will than was her wont, and it was with difficulty she remained seated during the time the meal lasted, but she restrained herself, and William Douglas withdrew without seeming to have noticed her agitation. Scarcely had he gone than Mary ran to the window. She had need of air, and her gaze devoured in advance those wide horizons which she was about to cross anew. It seemed to her that once at liberty she would never shut herself up in a palace again, but would wander about the countryside continually. Then, amid all these tremors of delight, from time to time she felt unexpectedly heavy at heart. She then turned round to Mary Seaton, trying to fortify her strength with hers, and the young girl kept up her hopes, but rather from duty than from conviction. But slow as they seemed to the queen, the hours yet passed. Towards the afternoon some clouds floated across the blue sky. The queen remarked upon them joyfully to her companion, and Mary Seaton congratulated her upon them, not on account of the imaginary omen that the queen sought in them, but because of the real importance that the weather should be cloudy, that darkness might aid them in their flight. While the two prisoners were watching the billowy moving vapors, the hour of dinner arrived, but it was half an hour of constraint and dissimulation. The more painful that, no doubt in return for the sort of goodwill shown him by the Queen in the morning, William Douglas thought himself obliged in his turn to accompany his duties with fitting compliments, which compelled the Queen to take a more active part in the conversation than her preoccupation allowed her. But William Douglas did not seem in any way to observe this absence of mind, and all passed as at breakfast. Directly he had gone, the Queen ran to the window. The few clouds which were chasing one another in the sky an hour before had thickened and spread and all the blue was blotted out to give place to a hue dull and leaden as pewter mary stuart's presentiments were thus raised as to the little house in kinross which one could still make out in the dusk it remained shut up and seemed deserted night fell the light shone as usual and the queen signalled it disappeared mary stuart waited in vain everything remained in darkness the escape was for the same evening the queen heard eight o'clock nine o'clock and ten o'clock strike successively. At ten o'clock the sentinels were relieved. 
Mary Stuart heard the patrols pass beneath her windows, the steps of the watch recede, then all returned to silence. Half an hour passed away thus. Suddenly the owl's cry resounded thrice. The queen recognized George Douglas's signal. The supreme moment had come. In these circumstances the queen found all her strength revive. She signed to Mary Seaton to take away the bar and to fix the rope ladder, while, putting out the lamp, she felt her way into the bedroom to seek the casket, which contained her few remaining jewels. When she came back, George Douglas was already in the room. "'All goes well, madame,' said he. "'Your friends await you on the other side of the lake. Thomas Warden watches at the postern, and God has sent us a dark night.' The queen, without replying, gave him her hand. George bent his knee and carried this hand to his lips, but on touching it he felt it cold and trembling. "'Madame,' said he, "'in heaven's name summon all your courage, and do not let yourself be downcast at such a moment.' "'Our lady of good help,' murmured Seaton, "'come to our aid.' "'Summon to you the spirit of the king's ancestors,' responded George, "'for at this moment it is not the resignation of a Christian that you require, but the strength and resolution of a queen.' "'Oh, Douglas, Douglas,' cried Mary mournfully, a fortune-teller predicted to me that I should die in prison and by a violent death. Has not the hour of the prediction arrived? Perhaps, George said, but it is better to die as a queen than to live in this ancient castle, calumniated and as a prisoner. You are right, George, the queen answered, but for a woman the first step is everything. Forgive me. Then, after a moment's pause, Come, said she, I am ready. George immediately went to the window, secured the ladder again and more firmly, then getting up onto the sill and holding to the bars with one hand, he stretched out the other to the queen, who, as resolute as she had been timid a moment before, mounted on a stool and had already set one foot on the window ledge, when suddenly the cry, "'Who goes there?' rang out at the foot of the tower. The queen sprang quickly back, partly instinctively and partly pushed by George, who, on the contrary, leaned out of the window to see whence came this cry which twice again renewed, remained twice unanswered, and was immediately followed by a report and the flash of a firearm. At the same moment the sentinel on duty on the tower blew his bugle, another set going the alarm bell and the cries, To arms! To arms! And treason! Treason! resounded throughout the castle. Yes! Yes! Treason! Treason! cried George Douglas, leaping down into the room. Yes, the infamous warden has betrayed us! Then, advancing to Mary, cold and motionless as a statue, "'Courage, madam,' said he, "'courage. Whatever happens, a friend yet remains for you in the castle. It is little Douglas.' Scarcely had he finished speaking when the door of the Queen's apartment opened, and William Douglas and Lady Lochlaven, preceded by servants carrying torches and armed soldiers, appeared on the threshold. The room was immediately filled with people and light. "'Mother!' said William Douglas, pointing to his brother standing before Mary Stuart and protecting her with his body. "'Do you believe me now? Look!' The old lady was for a moment speechless, then finding a word at last and taking a step forward. "'Speak, George Douglas!' cried she. "'Speak and clear yourself at once of the charge which weighs on your honour. Say but these words. A Douglas was never faithless to his trust, and I believe you.' "'Yes, mother,' answered William, "'a Douglas. But he, he is not a Douglas.' may god grant my old age the strength needed to bear on the part of one of my sons such a misfortune and on the part of the other such an injury exclaimed lady lochlaven oh a woman born under a fatal star she went on addressing the queen when will you cease to be in the devil's hands an instrument of perdition and death to all who approach you Oh, ancient house of Lochlaven, cursed be the hour when this enchantress crossed thy threshold. Do not say that, mother, do not say that, cried George. Blessed be, on the contrary, the moment which proves that, if there are Douglases who no longer remember what they owe to their sovereigns, there are others who have never forgotten it. Douglas, Douglas, murmured Mary Stuart, did I not tell you? And I, madame, said George, what did I reply then? that it was an honour and a duty to every faithful subject of your majesty to die for you. "'Well, die then!' cried William Douglas, springing on his brother with raised sword, while he leaped back, drew his, and with a movement quick as thought and eager as hatred defended himself. But at the same moment Mary Stuart darted between the two young people. "'Not another step, Lord Douglas,' 
said she, sheath your sword, George, or if you use it, let be to go hence, and against every one but your brother. I still have need of your life. Take care of it. My life, like my arm and my honor, is at your service, madame, and from the moment you command it I shall preserve it for you. With these words, rushing to the door with a violence and resolve which prevented any one stopping him, back! cried he to the domestics who were barring the passage. Make way for your young master of Douglas, or woe to you! Stop him! cried William. Seize him, dead or alive! Fire upon him! Kill him like a dog! Two or three soldiers, not daring to disobey William, pretended to pursue his brother. Then some gunshots were heard, and a voice crying that George Douglas had just thrown himself into the lake. And has he escaped then? cried William. Mary Stuart breathed again. The old lady raised her hands to heaven. "'Yes, yes,' murmured William. "'Yes, thank heaven for your son's flight, for his flight covers our entire house with shame. Counting from this hour, we shall be looked upon as the accomplices of his treason.' "'Have pity on me, William,' cried Lady Lochlaven, wringing her hands. "'Have compassion on your old mother. See you not that I am dying?' With these words she fell backwards. Pale and tottering, the steward and a servant supported her in their arms. "'I believe, my lord,' said Mary Seaton, coming forward, "'that your mother has as much need of attention just now as the queen has need of repose. Do you not consider it is time for you to withdraw?' "'Yes, yes,' said William. "'To give you time to spin fresh webs, I suppose, and to seek what fresh flies you can take in them. It is well. Go on with your work.' "'But you have just seen that it is not easy to deceive William Douglas. "'Play your game. I shall play mine.' "'Then turning to the servants, "'Go out, all of you,' said he, "'and you, mother, come.' "'The servants and the soldiers obeyed. "'Then William Douglas went out last, supporting Lady Lochlaven, "'and the queen heard him shut behind him "'and double-lock the two doors of her prison. "'Scarcely was Mary alone, and certain that she was no longer seen or heard, "'than all her strength deserted her, and sinking into an armchair, she burst out sobbing. Indeed, all her courage had been needed to sustain her so far, and the sight of her enemies alone had given her this courage, but hardly had they gone than her situation appeared before her in all its fatal hardship. Dethroned, a prisoner, without another friend in this impregnable castle than a child, to whom she had scarce given attention, and who was the sole and last threat attaching her past hopes to her hopes for the future, what remained to Mary Stuart of her two thrones and her double power? Her name, that was all. Her name, with which free she had doubtless stirred Scotland, but which little by little was about to be effaced in the hearts of her adherents, and which during her lifetime oblivion was to cover perhaps as with a shroud. Such an idea was insupportable to a soul as lofty as Mary Stuart's, and to an organization which, like that of the flowers, has need before everything of air, light, and sun. Fortunately, there remained to her the best beloved of her four Marys, who, always devoted and consoling, hastened to succor and comfort her, but this time it was no easy matter, and the queen let her act and speak without answering her otherwise than with sobs and tears, when suddenly, looking through the window to which she had drawn up her mistress's armchair, "'The light!' cried she. "'Madam, the light!' At the same time she raised the queen, and, with an arm outstretched from the window, she showed her the beacon— the eternal symbol of hope, relighted in the midst of this dark night on Kinross Hill. There was no mistake possible, not a star was shining in the sky. "'Lord God, I give thee thanks,' said the queen, falling on her knees and raising her arms to heaven with a gesture of gratitude. "'Douglas has escaped, and my friends still keep watch.' Then, after a fervent prayer which restored her to a little strength, the queen re-entered her room, and, tired out by her varied successive emotions, she slept in uneasy, agitated sleep, over which the indefatigable Mary Seaton kept watch till daybreak. As William Douglas had said, from this time forward the queen was a prisoner indeed, and permission to go down into the garden was no longer granted, but under the surveillance of two soldiers. But this annoyance seemed to her so unbearable, that she preferred to give up the recreation, which surrounded with such conditions became a torture. So she shut herself up in her apartments, finding a certain bitter and haughty pleasure in the very excess of her misfortune. End of chapter 6 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia